This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and this is the Acer Iconia 6120. This certainly, for the moment, is virtually a unique notebook computer. Uh, the only other thing like it has been the Toshiba Libretto W105 that we reviewed many months ago, a little limited edition for remembering the Libretto franchise as it was. That was a 7-inch dual-screen notebook. What we have here is a 14-inch dual touchscreen notebook. That's right, you've got two 14-inch 1366 by 768 panels here, and a virtual keyboard down here. Of course you can use an external USB keyboard if you want, but not a Bluetooth one, because oddly this well-equipped machine that sells for $11.99 doesn't have Bluetooth. That has pretty much everything else. As we mentioned, it's $11.99. It's surprisingly affordable for something that's probably pretty expensive to make. You've got these two touch screens right here. These are capacitive multi-touch. You've got 10 points of touch supported, which is actually useful for some of the utilities we'll show you later, where you lay both hands down and all fingers to trigger certain actions. It has an Intel Core i5. It's a full Core i5, not a ULV CPU. It's 2.66 gigahertz with Turbo Boost. It can go even faster. Uh, this is not Sandy Bridge. This is not second gen Intel, unfortunately. And we're starting to see those notebooks coming out now with the, the second gen, but hey, can't have everything. It's still quite fast and it benchmarks at around 5700 in PC Mark Vantage, which is a little bit better than the category average for mid sized notebook computers. It has a 640 gig, 5400 RPM hard drive in here, conventional standard hard drive. 4 gigs of DDR3 RAM, 8 gigs is the max, and it has two DIMM slots. And we'll show you, it's very easy to upgrade this guy. Wi-Fi 802.11bgn is also here. But again, what makes, makes this very interesting is two screens, and we'll discuss the usability of that. But first we're going to take a look around the notebook, because you can see it's, it's very attractively designed. Acer really made a chic and kind of understated product. When it's open, it has a, a mega wow factor, because you're seeing this glass panel down here. But I like the champagne colored accents over here, the black, or black is always going to look nice. So when you close it, you've got a kind of champagne lid here that almost looks like your everyday normal notebook. A little rubberized area here, really like that a lot, so when you tilt it back, you can flatten this out to one, 180 degrees to look at both screens in parallel. You're not going to conk anything on the desk. Front edge over here, again, nice use of gloss black plastics with the champagne aluminum metal. These are metal covers, top and bottom. And this six pound beast has a removable metal bottom plate here, and this is where you access the hard drive and other internal components. You just slide the rubber feet you can see there's lock on lock symbols. Push up like the arrow says, and then you grab it like that. And take off the lid. Here's your two RAM slots, your hard drive. You've got a wireless card in here, and you've got a mini PCIe slot available inside. And here's the fan. It runs fairly cool, by the way, uh, even doing things like streaming Hulu and other intensive tasks. It's about maybe 95 degrees on the bottom. The idea of measuring touchpad temperature is a little bit odd when your touchpad and hand rest temperatures are on a glass display, but there's nothing uncomfortable going on there in terms of temperatures. But before we put this back on, you just drop it and slide it in to lock it. If you want to take out the battery, it is a removable battery, and you slide the release latches over here, and this barrel section pops out. We won't do that now because the computer is sleeping, but it's just this little barrel right here. It's a real small battery. It's 2900 milliamps, that's all. And you can get, imagine what that means. This guy only runs about two and a half hours with moderate use on a charge. But given the small battery, it doesn't need a very big power supply, and we've got an exceptionally teeny power brick. Now looking at the ports on the side, this is where you plug in the power over here, ventilation. Here's your HDMI out, two USB 2.0 ports on the left side. Take a look on the other side. Oh, one more thing. This button right here in the hinge barrel, this one will pop up the on-screen keyboard just in case it's not open when you need it to be. Now onto the other side, this is your power button right here, your gigabit ethernet port, VGA as well as HDMI, that's kind of nice, it's becoming a rarity, lock slot, one USB 3.0 port for you folks who have high-speed USB 3.0 peripherals, SP diff headphone jack, and a separate mic jack, it's nice to have those. Nothing on the front edge, just a clean look. You do have your LED indicators here for power, charging, and hard disk access, and that's it. I really like the look of the lid. It's, it's metal. It's kind of understated, but very classy. This doesn't look like your average plastic cheesy notebook. Acer did a really good job here, and it's kind of symmetrical in a way 
turn upside down and really quite similar in a lot of ways. You just got the vents over here and a larger inset Acer logo on the bottom. One of the things that we like best about this is when you have two screens that are available side by side and you're not using one for keyboard input, you probably want to have the option of having them both parallel to you. And what I mean by that is this opens completely flat. So you can work with both displays facing at you. It would be amazing if somebody could make a stand strong enough to hold this guy upright in presentation mode. All right, now let's take a look at the, the software and the on-screen keyboard. First I want to mention up here I have a 1.3 megapixel webcam that seems to work just fine with Skype as far as we can tell so far. This is the virtual keyboard down here and you can see it's pretty large. It's, it's the size of a standard notebook keyboard and yes you can touch type on it but you're not going to have tactile feedback. This is too large for haptics so you're going to get like the iPhone clicky sound which is useful and I find that I can type very quickly only if I watch my hands as a touch typist because you don't realize how much your hands are actually wandering without actually having physical keys to touch. It is designed so that you can lay both your palms and your fingers in the home position on the keyboard. It does a good job of that. So just by resting your hands on the keyboard, you're not constantly entering. It waits for you to lift up and then hit again on the key. So that works pretty well. I wouldn't mind this for typing up to 500, maybe 1,000 words. It's, it's not really that bad. But if you're a serious touch typist who counts on the keyboard, this probably is not your kind of product unless you want to use an external USB keyboard with it. So we've got a virtual touchpad here and a right click left click button. That works pretty fine. The default tracking is a little set to the slow side but that's adjustable. doesn't really matter. Besides, you can touch anywhere on the screen here because this again is capacitive multi-touch. This does not have an EMR pen or an active digitizer. That means no Wacom pen, no note taking with a pen, no graphic artist drawing with pressure sensitivity. None of that. This isn't like the E-Slate or the HP TM2 or anything like that. So of limited appeal probably to graphic artists and those of you who need to take notes in the field, that kind of thing. Back to the keyboard over here, you can see the home keys are always highlighted in color for you. And when you first turn on the computer, it takes you through some training and it sets the key pitch, the separation of the keys, based on how you type some sample sentences. And I found that really helped. Don't ignore the training if you get one of these. Go through that, you type a few sentences and it really does a good job of setting it optimally for you. What does that mean if you share this with somebody else? Hopefully they need about the same key separation as you do, or one of you won't be very happy. Here's a close box up here if you want to get rid of the keyboard and have your second display just be available for looking at applications and windows and things like that. You can go to settings and you can see you can set the volume of the key click sound. You can choose from several skins. I like the default one just fine. You can set the size of the FN keys. We have it set to the standard size, which is quite small, and that's fine. And you can run the wizard for keyboard training if you find it didn't work for you the first time, or you did go ahead and skip it. You can customize keyboard layout, set it to default, and there are some settings for handwriting, but I tell you, I have been trying it, and writing with your finger is just not a whole lot of fun. This has all the tablet PC software from Windows 7 that you'd expect, with the tablet input panel available and all that kind of thing, but you probably don't want to spend a lot of time writing with your finger. I did try a capacitive stylus with this guy, a little one, and uh, it worked fine for tapping on icons and things like that, but it really didn't follow my, my hand at all for handwriting or for drawing. It skipped a lot, and I think that's because it's trying to figure out the whole multi-touch kind of thing. With, a, with an active digitizer, it knows to ignore your hand and capacitive input when you're using active, active digitizer input. So how about typing? I'm going to demonstrate touch typing with this. And I rest my palms down just like you normally would typing and then and that is actually what I typed right there. Now occasionally I do make mistakes, it's not perfect, but you'd be surprised at once you get used to this how often you can be accurate. Not bad. Again, if your primary use is lots of typing on the road, not your kind of computer, but if you have a use for the dual screens for other things, worth a look. All right, now say I want to get rid of the keyboard over here and have my Word document go down there, no problem. And then I can go check up something on the web maybe that I needed to look up while I was working on my document, as an example use case for this kind of product. 
it's pretty handy. It's like having, you know, two monitors built into one. And you do have HDMI and VGA as well, so you could actually hook up a large external monitor and really go to town working with several windows at once. Possibly handy for you video editors and other folks who need to have lots of windows available while you're working. So that's IE, which of course has touch awareness. The, the entire operating system, all Windows 7 and uh, all Microsoft applications are very touch aware. It means you have things like pinch zooming, panning around with your finger. You can highlight text like I just did over here by pressing and holding. So you can do all that kind of stuff. And Acer has enlarged some of the menus and things like that to make it a little bit easier to be touch friendly. Now honestly, Windows 7 has been making tablets that are optimized for 12.1 inch displays for some time, so the controls are usually reasonably easy to use. Since this is up to 14 inches, your, your targets and controls are pretty finger friendly for an operating system that wasn't designed to be entirely mobile and finger friendly anyway. Now what happens if I want to bring up the on-screen keyboard again? I can either hit this button over here on the side or you can just lay both hands on. And just like that, it comes back. Pretty cool. Acer did some nice custom software for this thing. And what if I want to bring up their special set of utilities? I'll show you over here. As you can see, there's a little hint here on the desktop. You just pinch your fingers in. Works better if you close the keyboard first before you do this. And you've got the Acer Ring. And these are custom applications and, and skins that they've designed particularly for this. They've got the touch browser here, which is, I would say it's got to be a skinned version of IE. And you can scroll through these things. You've got touch music, touch photo, touch video. Uh, you know, the music, photo, and video apps, they're not so necessary. Social Jogger is really pretty cool. I'm going to show you that one right now. I only wish this one had Twitter, too. And it's loading all my social network feeds up and refreshing right here. So we've got Facebook here, we've got my YouTube account over here, and this would be for Flickr. And those are the three accounts that are supported. And you can do things like drag and, drag and drop media too here. So you want to upload a video to, to YouTube, just drag it right on over here. And if you want to upload a picture or something like that to Facebook, you can. So this is pretty nice. And you can have this running down here while you've got your browser or your productivity software going up here, whatever it is, watching a movie, that kind of thing. In fact, let's check out some movie playback. We've got a 1080 clip sample over here. Right now we're in the music list. And we will switch over to video. So there we've got a high quality movie playing up there. While we're doing our social networking down here. Pretty cool. As you can hear, it's pretty nice speakers. The speakers fire at the bottom. You can see the little drivers when you take the bottom off. And for speakers that are aiming down, they sound pretty good. Let's bring up that ring again. And we can take a look at the touch browser next. As I said, it looks like a skin over Internet Explorer. Now, what's neat about this is that it's designed to be able to run across two pages. So you've got an incredibly tall page available, and you can grab down here and scroll up there. And you can touch on both screens again. And it moves the URL bar down here, which is much more convenient than trying to reach up there. And you've got all your controls to add to favorites, to go home, to, to print, to get help. And you can hit this little window switcher button over here just to shift it up there. And then hit it again if you want it in double window mode. So that's pretty sweet, and that, that is a good use of the dual display. I have to say, I think we still need to see even more software that justifies having the two screens, but that's a good start. I've just opened up the ring again, and wherever you do your, your pin to zoom motion to bring it up is where it opens up. So if, if you prefer to have these windows showing up on that side, pinch zoom over here, and it'll open them up over there. The last one we've got here, we've got a scrapbook. We'll take a quick look at that. It takes a little bit of time for some of these apps to load. I can understand with the social networking because downloading your data over the net, but here's an example of their scrapbook. You can draw, draw pictures in here. I believe you can even drop audio files, all that kind of thing, and write with your finger. Just choose your tool. I'm going to go with bright blue. And there you go, and you can set your line thickness and all that kind of thing. So for those of you who like to scrapbook virtually, digitally, this is for you.
and you can choose from all your sample pictures that you've got available or anything that you've loaded up to. So just drag that over there and there it is. It's kind of fun. I'm sure kids would find it remarkably entertaining. And the last one is My Journal. And you can do things like uh, drag web pages over here. It's actually saving a live URL, so it's not a snapshot of that web page in time. So if you put the New York Times front page here today, it ain't going to look the same the next time you open it up tomorrow, for example. But it can be a handy way of tracking stuff that you're working on. You can put documents and other things here, too. One last thing that I want to mention is, see it says, draw a gesture here, if you can read that, it's quite small. You can also use gestures to launch applications and do stuff like that, too, and you can tell it what you want that gesture to be, and it'll do it, and it works pretty well. And you've got the gesture editor over here where you can define those things. I'll show that to you. And these are the two default ones that you've seen already, laying the hands on to open up the keyboard and doing the five finger squish to open up the Acer wheel. So if you want to add a new gesture, for example, launch Windows Explorer or open a URL, do a search, and then you can just enter in the URL and then define your gesture. So it's having me enter. So now we, we've entered our URL over here, and I'm going to draw, pick a gesture that I want to draw. And obviously you have to use longer gestures so this doesn't misinterpret, so I will choose that. And then we're done. So now we'll test out our gesture. And there it is. You have to actually exceed outside the ring. You start inside that little ring there and then you move on your way out and it's going ahead and launched our web page for me. So who is the Acer Iconi F6124? It's uh, for you early adopters, you gadget types, those of you who maybe got a Toshiba Libretto W105 and said, hey, this thing is too underpowered and didn't have good battery life on it. I need something bigger that I can actually work with. It is obviously not for those of you who are into serious data entry and need a real keyboard. This is more for media consumption, those of you who need to have multiple monitors. I mean, this is pretty cool. You can take this with you anywhere, and you've got two monitors built in. It's great for those of you who need to have a web browser open in one and word processing, or maybe you're doing some kind of web work and web design work. You need multiple screens. Imagine hooking up an HDMI monitor when you're at home or work as well, and you've got three screens to work with. Likewise, great for video editing and for Photoshop people who don't need the pen, the active digitizer. Uh, it's for you germ freaks, too, because though this is Gorilla Glass and it has a anti-fingerprint coating on it and stays fairly clean, let me tell you, once you start using this as your actual real keyboard, you realize just how disgusting your regular traditional hardware keyboard actually gets. Ugh. It's absolutely clean. After you wipe it down with a little damp cloth or something like that, no germs, no nothing. Also, it's for those of you who need not just a 14-inch screen, but you need the power of a full Core i5. Granted, it's not Sandy Bridge, but still, straight old first-gen Core i5 is quite fast, especially with 2.66 gigahertz, 640 gig hard drive, 4 gigs of RAM with a max of 8. Those are pretty good specs. This can handle Photoshop, this can handle 1080p video playback, most everything except for intense 3D games, because this has Intel HD graphics, the original HD graphics. If it were Sandy Bridge, you'd have HD 3000, which turned out to be quite capable of an integrated graphics solution. But this guy, not so much. Uh, you can play World of Warcraft at 1024 by 768, and maybe get, say, 17 FIPS or so. I play older games just fine, but you're not going to be playing Crisis or Fear 2 and really getting any great FIPS out of this. Kind of a shame it's not a gaming notebook with a GPU in it because with the two screens it could really mean some interesting interactions in gaming. But alas, that probably would have really tanked the battery life further and made it run hotter and perhaps even be larger. So those are design trade-offs when you've got something like this going. But for everything else, productivity work, graphic design kind of stuff, it's fine. So that's the Acer Iconia 6120 dual screen touchbook notebook. Visit Mobile Tech Review to read the full review.